and welcome back to FIDA World Women's Team Chess Championship. I'm one Grandmaster Dina Belenka and here with me Grandmaster in a crush. And right now we are having the second round of the semifinals and very soon we'll find out who is going to be the team to face another team in the finals. But before that, we do have a very special announcement for you. And this is FIDAChess.com Grand Swiss coming in October. The FIDA Chess.com Grand Swiss this year will be played in Riga, Latvia. Two spots in the 2022 Candidates Tournament and one spot in the next Women's Candidate Tournament are up for grabs as well as a 5050 5, total prize fund. 5050, 5, wait, what? 550,000. Okay, 550,000 total prize fund. Now it makes perfect sense. Who will make the next step to become a world champion? And the most important part of it is that this event is going to have one of the best producers right on the spot. So do not miss this one. And uh, as far as for today, let us take a look at what is waiting for us right now. We do have the second round where Team Ukraine really needs to strike back against Team Russia. Um, what do you think, Irina? Is that going to be an easy job for them? Yeah, well, I think what's interesting is that we should note that actually both teams have switched up their board fours. And we got Natalia Buxa coming in for Yulia Osmak and uh, Polina Shivalova replacing Alina Kishlinska, who won in the last round. So Russia obviously feels like the alternates. Um, they give them each a chance to play, but they stick with their most experienced players on the top three boards, as does Ukraine. Um, we also see uh, something similar happening in the match between Georgia and India. Actually, there are some substitutions as well. We got Tanya Sajdev coming in, and um, she is now playing Mary Arabidze rather than um, a Salome Melia, who is playing Kulkarni Bhakti. So those two players are sitting out right now. Lela Javahashvili and Marianne Gomez both won their games last round, and now they're matched up against each other on board four. So a little bit of a switcheroo there um, from, from both sides. And um, yeah, I mean, Russia and Ukraine, I mean, Russia's got the lead. Uh, based on that first round, Ukraine has to win. Um, not an easy task against such a uh, well-playing team. And India and Georgia drew each other. So um, let's see who gets the upper hand in this match. I mean, it did seem like a very close match, actually, in that first round. Yeah, that is going to be very interesting. And we will have the games... Uh starting very very shortly we do see alexandra kostinuk on our screens shaking the hands of uh, maria muzichuk and there they go we do have the moves mm, interesting um i'm wondering how much uh, is is the time that the players have during the two rounds enough for them to check some preparations? What do you think, Irina? Well, that's a good question. I have to say it's, I find it very unfortunate if that's what they're spending their time on between the rounds rather than just eating and resting. Um, I mean, I would certainly as a player try not to do that as much as possible. I would um, just, you know, the more lines you put into your head, the more tired you get and I feel like it's um, not the optimal way to spend your time. But of course, some players might feel like it's more of a necessity. Um, and I have to say that in general, I think for the players, um, I would find it difficult to play this format. I mean, for us as the commentators, it's fun. You know, we get two rounds a day. The time control is just like um, somewhere in the middle between slow chess and fast chess. I think the fans will like it. But for the players, I feel like it's pretty difficult because actually you are preparing for two games a day. So basically your workload has um, multiplied. Um, and, you know, you cannot really call this rapid chess. You know, when you play rapid chess, preparation doesn't play quite as much of a role, right? 
Um, but this is, you know, a team event, very, um, very responsible sort of weight placed on the players playing for their countries. And, um, and the time control is not like, you know, where you can just play completely substandard lines, you know, because you're playing blitz chess or, you know, 15 minute chess, 45 minute chess. It's, it's a, in a way, I think the opening preparation is a little closer probably to the uh, preparation you do for classical. And so that means that the players actually have to work twice as hard. It's not actually all that easy just because it's a shorter tournament. It just means that their work and their preparation has to be compressed into, um, you know, compressed into the shorter time. Um, I mean, I think maybe for the players um, who are working on chess all the time, you know, the um, like the, the players from Russia and Ukraine, it's probably a doable format. I mean, they've done most of their preparation before the tournament. Uh, for someone like me, you know, where I, I don't actually work on chess uh, full time and I have to work like more during the event itself, it definitely would be a difficult format. Um, another reason why for myself, I wasn't as enthusiastic about it, but from the point of view of just watching the games and like the action that we get as fans, it's, it's great. Yeah, totally. And you know, it actually means that instead of having one preparation for a day with one color, they actually need to make two preparations and to come up with two, uh, openings for, as they, they change the alternate colors and, uh, Wow, you highlighted a very important point. I do agree here that uh, it might even be tougher in terms of like energy wise that you need to waste for such kind of formats. Yeah, you know, for sure. I mean, it's not something obvious and unless you really look at it from a player's point of view. Like I would expect, you know, for just like people watching at home, not really to realize what that means for a chess player to play with both colors two games a day. And it's just because you decrease the time control doesn't mean that you've made it so easy for them because the time control is decreased. But again, it's not rapid chess. It's not game 15 where, I mean, even that, I have to tell you, I mean, there is serious preparation that goes into playing rapid games at this level, you know, for the online Olympiad, which was a game 15 time control, I would still have to prepare, you know, the whole day. Uh, really, like when we had uh, a couple of days off between uh, the preliminaries and the quarterfinals, I, I spent that whole weekend, you know, preparing for my match with uh, Jean Saya Abdumalik, like hours and hours on Sunday, especially. I mean, just to play two rapid games, that's it. But, you know, you have to solve problems for both colors, um, you know, and, and <laughs> that's not a small task. Yeah, and here it's like, you don't have two days off be between each match. So it's like, you finish one, the next day, you have two more people to prepare for. Well, it's possibly two. Uh, for most of these people, it's the same person that they're playing with both colors, but still two colors to prepare for. It's really a big workload on the players, but, you know, that's just my kind of take um, on the internal dynamics of, of playing in this format. Um, but for us, you know, commentating on it, I do think it's it's an attractive format. Yes, absolutely. And thank you, Rina, for this uh, perspective of a... Of a, of a grandmaster that you get. I believe not everyone uh, actually understands how much work is there behind the scenes for a single, very single one game of chess. And here we have two. So yeah, I agree with everything mentioned above. Now let us probably go and take a look what is happening on the boards. We do have some kind of scotch. I believe main line of scotch here in the game between Anna Muzichuk and Alexander Gerashkina. I personally do play Scotch, so I'm very interested to see what is going to happen this game. Irina, how familiar are you with this opening? Okay, I'm not, first of all, familiar at all with the move G3. I mean, it's not the main move. I've never um, even seen that. It's so unfamiliar to me compared to the move C4. Um, so obviously, okay, this time we see Anna being more prepared because she already has a five minute advantage on the clock uh, compared to Geriachkina. So I think she succeeded in surprising her. Um, do you know anything about this move G3? Well, to be honest, no. And I, what I, as far as I can see, it is, a, it is a move number four in the book, right after, as you mentioned, C4, then we go with H4, 92, and only 45 games in the base with a move G3. 
And I'm really curious to see what direction is this going to take us to. Um, here we already have a move. This is a5. Seems pretty logical opening the bishop, attacking the queen. All right, I would expect here bishop g2 from uh, Anna. Yeah, bishop g2, bishop a6, c4. Um, now we actually have c4, right? Yeah. Pawn does not attack the knight because of the pin, but the king will or the queen will go away. Yeah, here white is just trying to castle quickly to get their king out of the center, which is sometimes a problem for white's king. And when they do that, they're in a better position to protect the e5 pawn. So, okay, I mean, I get the concept, I and mean, it's a fairly standard idea to fianchetto that bishop when it's being blocked by the queen. I just am not so familiar with it being done immediately. But I guess white is trying to say, you know, if you think about it, and Dina, when white plays c4, blacks, one of black's main moves is bishop a6. And um, now white is trying to say, well, I think my development with g3 is actually more useful than your move a5, which oh, yeah. I would agree with. I mean, a5 is not useless. It does kind of help in some positions, but g3 is a very direct developing move. So um, I think it's a good, you know, it's a good concept for rapid chess and it's interesting that obviously the move a5 surprised anna because now she's the one thinking but in a way i feel like it's probably better that she's surprised because she's the one who prepared this so she knows a5 is not the best move oh i see your logic so it actually makes a lot of sense right so here we have two options we have either bishop g2 or we can also try to go with something like h4 but this would be more like computer style of move I expect bishop g2, this is the most natural. Anna is thinking. And uh, yeah, well, once you're out of your preparation, you should probably take some minutes to, to see what has just happened. What are the changes on the board? Even if you, let's say, are ready to make your next move, you should still take that time just to make sure that you do not blunder anything and do not miss any hidden ideas. Yeah, let's see. Alexandra, she seems very much deep in thought. Let's see what's going on in her board. Wow, what is this? E4, oh, it's C5. kind of a Sicilian. Yeah, it's a kind of anti-Sicilian. Ah, uh -huh. C3. This is the favorite lapping of Alexandra Kostinuk. She has been playing it a lot recently. She has played it actually quite often online. And I believe she also had some games in the last over the board tournament she had before the pandemic which was uh in Lo in lausanne lausanne grand prix yeah right she also had some elaborate games there and i remember her commenting on this um on her own streams as you know um she uh, she's a chess streamer as well under the the name chess queen and here we go with d4 knight a3 knight c6 bishop d3 f5 wow interesting f5 so f5 allows our favorite en passant, the one that the one that um, our viewers get extremely excited about, simply taking the pawn. But here it wasn't the right decision because this e5 pawn is extremely strong in the center. And after h4, knight h6, bishop b5, there are absolutely no games like this in the base, which means that this might be the novelty. Yeah, I mean it's a very unusual position for me. I mean I've certainly, <clears throat> I mean the whole uh, situation in the center, that's a kind of a familiar concept, but uh, these exact moves, f5, h4, um, it's definitely taken the game into um, a unique path. And so Alexandra, she is white, and it looks like, okay, it looks like black is thinking right after bishop b5. And the most logical move is bishop d7. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if that was played. Um, what I mean, she probably doesn't really want to allow bishop take c6, even though I don't know how deadly that is. I mean, um, maybe theoretically you can even allow that. But is something wrong with bishop d7? That's the question. I think white just basically wants to go like d3. Yeah, that's um, actually... Yeah, d3 attacking the knight on h6, and the knight can go to f7, very solid square. The bishop will go maybe to f4 to protect. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm expecting the move bishop d7, although what else can she do? I mean, yeah, getting out of the pin seems to make sense, doesn't it? 
Yeah, it totally does. And you know, this D3 move mm, brings me a lot of joy because it reminds me of my yesterday's um, de- debut at uh, four player chess. You know, um, if you have ever tried this variant on chess.com, you have four players playing the same game. And uh, sometimes the bishops are uh, the pieces that are the most dangerous. You really need to watch out from one corner to another. It can be crossing the whole board. And sometimes you miss this. So the idea of playing d3 and uh, attacking the, I mean, attacking the capture on h6, ruining the pawns, let's see, black does something like this, is really something I do uh, find quite funny here. And uh, sometimes easy to miss. Yeah, interesting what will happen. I think it's, well, first of all, I think Maria Muzichuk is doing a good job with her opening selection. And, um, you know, as we said, Team Ukraine has to win. So just making draws with the black pieces is not necessarily enough. And I think her opening choice, she had um, various things she could have chosen from. She went for the Sicilian. That tells us something about Ukraine's strategy here. Yeah, that is true. And also, bishop d7 and d3 already moves happen on the board. Uh huh. So, bishop d7 and d3 has happened, right? So, yeah, I don't think she will allow bishop takes h6. So, the only question is, should you go knight g4? I mean, it's actually okay because it's not like the pawn can go to h3. I think it'll be kind of hard to trap the knight. I think knight g4 might just be more active than knight f7. Knight of seven's not too terrible looking either, but I mean, let's put knight g4 on the board and see if the computer stays with the same nice evaluation he has. So he doesn't love it. He thinks it's equal. Um, does he like knight f7 more? Let's try that one. Knight f7. Ooh. Well, it's certainly better than knight g4. It also is in the spirit of the position, attacking the potential weakness here and uh i have wow. to say dina if, if knight c4 a6 black is just a super comfortable game i mean they're gonna get the white's bishop from them they're gonna get to put their bishop on c6 i mean uh, let's put a6 on the board bishop takes and um bishop takes and yeah i don't know despite the computer saying it's not too terrible for white i would just be extremely satisfied with black's position here you know, sometimes it can be just like in that night end game that we had in the previous game of these two players. Uh, computer was saying it was all fine, but we humans, we knew that something was very dangerous there for, for the side that had a passive king, uh, which was Maria. And uh, yeah, it could very much be here that computer doesn't understand the potential threats. By the way, we have knight g4 here on the board. Yeah. This is not the strongest. Now let me update you on what computer thinks about this position. And this is not something that we considered. It is D takes B3. And now after B takes, oh, sorry, um, D takes C3. And now after B takes C3, we have A6 claiming that here, black is having the biggest advantage of all. Nice, nice line. Interesting how, he, uh, bl- uh, you know, black has opened the center, opened up the D file. Um, and kind of hard from an intuitive point of view. I mean, because you're by capturing on C3, you're giving up a pawn on the fourth rank for a pawn on the second, and you're also giving up a D pawn for a B pawn. Um, that breaks some principles. Um, letting your opponent take on H6, um, it's understandable. Yes, you open the G file, the double pawns are not, you know, unheard of. But um, but it is hard to play this way as black. I feel like you do need to be a bit of a computer to make these evaluations. And knight g4 is just very human-like. And, um, and you know, I, I, I think it's fine, you know. Uh, the difference probably between knight f7 and knight g4 is not too huge. All right. So we do expect knight c4 is the most logical move. And then after a6, yeah, we'll see bishop takes. Oh. There is an intermediate here, bishop g5, but let's assume bishop takes, bishop takes. And now we will really need to make sure that no one is chasing our knight too far away from the action. Yeah, no, this is going to be an interesting game. So let's see what's going on with Elagno. She is playing with Shenana. Yeah, this is interesting. Ooh, here we have some kind of King's Indian. Let's very fast see what was happening here. Yeah, very 
I was just about to say very classical Kingsian, but then I realized that in classical Kingsian, you kind of have the pawn on d6. And here we have knight to c6 and e5 with a pawn on d7. Well, I've never seen this one before. Very nice one. Yeah, neither have I. And, and finally, I we have d6. It's given <laughs> black an advantage on the clock. Wow. Although, um, you know, in terms of the position, I would feel fine here as white, of course. And most likely, she'll play queen d3 to defend that pawn. Um, I suppose taking on b5 is, is an option, but then that pawn will try to go to b4. It is an option. It's kind of strategically complicated, which is why she's spending some time here. It's hard to just play uh, moves without thinking, but it does look like, yeah, it's a Shenana's move right now. Um, queen d3 is more of the non-committal move where you just mm -hmm. defend the pawn and don't really uh, determine the pawn structure pawn takes b5 it's a big change to the pawn structure maybe you do that and then you um and then you say if only i had my knight on c5 and then you say go knight b7 yeah, <laughs> yeah that's it you go knight, knight b7 c5. and i'll go queen c2 Still a game. Yeah. You know? Um, but this is super creative, I yeah. have to admit. I really like the, the way how how Black did it. And let me just uh, to prove my um, um, my curiosity, Knight C6 does exist. And this, is, this is the move number four in the book. Right. Means still playable. And after E3, yeah, he, this this position have been played, but very very few games. And I'm wondering how uncomfortable is that so for was that for White? What? And I think I have an answer. Looking at the time, Anna did spend quite like 15 minutes, and uh, well, I and versus Katarina's 43, I might say that this was a, a slight achievement for Black so far. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if, you know, if the computer is evaluating this is around equal um, and she's got this big advantage on the clock and White has to, you know, make some not obvious decisions here, I agree that um, this is a successful opening for Block. Not necessarily that I don't like White's position because I totally would be fine playing this as White. In fact, I probably would still prefer White, but, um, um, but we got to acknowledge that black is uh, also going to get some counterplay here. Yeah. Like yeah, this allows power. knight c4, which I didn't. Oh, is this what? Oh, this happened in the game. Wow. So she did yeah. take and play b4. Oh, oh OK. Nice. I'm a little she surprised takes, by that decision. Before. You should um, have guessed. Yeah, no, but I wouldn't have guessed. I would have lost another dollar there. <gasps> oh, I would right, never have nice. guessed that white would go for this because I'm not so sure about why she's going for this. Um, you know, the knight on c4, it's just a powerful piece. And also black has ideas of c6 and kind of getting rid of that backwards pawn, creating another backwards pawn. But still c6 is quite a normal move, in my opinion. I mean, is she planning to play a4? But it's hard to see the point of that. That's just going to uh, that's going to be bad because you can just take and a knight takes his knight b6. Um, Okay, maybe you can stay alive with like knight ec3, but I just wouldn't want to do that. Um, is Katarina, she, is she still thinking after b4? Yeah, this is weird. Wait, no, now they have the move. It's knight c3. Yeah, it's knight c3. Yeah. Look at Katarina's time, still 40, almost 43 minutes. Wow, this is impressive. And um, yeah, I, uh, I should add, um, it reminds me of. Uh, Rui Lopez, you know, this fight for c5, c4 squares and Black eventually getting one of them is a very big strategical achievement in those kind of structures. Really the only difference yeah, I mean, should be like... I am really a little surprised about where Ushanana went with that decision. And of course, you know, Katarina's last couple of moves were just pretty much forced, so she just gets to make easy decisions. Um, okay, queen b3. So she's saying she wants to theoretically one day play a4. 
Um, I mean, well, she, if she can go A4, A5, I mean, that would be some kind of improvement for her. Um, so I think that's what that move is telling us. And now if C6, pawn takes, bishop takes, I guess there is A4. Yeah, correct. And, you, the, you know, that helps white. Knight. Mm -hmm. It's hanging. Cannot do that. And, uh, well, this is an achievement. Apparently here, the only way to stop um, the idea of white is to play on prophylactical level and to avoid C, uh, any A4 coming simply by getting the knight away to B6, which is not something that you want to do at first because you kind of like the knight on C4 and you don't really want to, to put it back. But in fact, this is a very wise decision. And here, A4 is not possible simply because of tactical reasons. Not enough. And what threats. would happen on bishop E3? So on knight B6, bishop E3, if you just kind of develop. I mean, of course, we know black can play knight C4, but that's not really, you know, yeah. like maybe black wants more than that. Ah, you can start with defending the knight, and now let's say you take, I take, and you play a4, and then I say watch out for your b4 pawn, because it might become a weakness one day. Queen b7. Coming with the I like rook. queen b8 a lot. Queen b8 is just a beautiful yeah. move. It's easy to forget about moves like that, because, you know, sliding the queen over on the back rank is maybe not as common as, like, trying to advance her somewhere up the board. Um, I wonder if she will play knight b6. I mean, at least... She's thinking now, and she finally has something to think about because, of course, she sees the A4 idea. Um, knight B6 is a little psychologically hard to play, mm, but I think she'll be forced to find it. I think she will notice that, you know, it's just too powerful an idea to let white carry it out. Correct. Right. Um, let us have a look how board number four is doing. We have Alina... We actually don't have Alina. We have Polina. Polina. Polina Shvalova here versus Natalia Buxa. Ooh, what do we have here? Some kind of a Queen's Gambit is my guess, right? If we go back, is it some maybe even a Not London? Not at all. Nope. It is Sicilian. Wow. wow. Sicilian versus Lima. Okay. I, I bet we already saw Polina's games with Russell Lima before. That is yes, nice. Yes, I just remember that. I just remembered that um, she does play Ooh. the Rose Lima. I have so many games here in this line. This is, in fact, one of my favorites. Although, starting from this point, I do not uh, recall it. Oh, maybe I do have something in my analysis. She like has this. a big edge on the clock. Wow, right. 10 minutes is a lot. Wow. She basically used no time at all to get to this position, which is uh, amazing. Must, must be her analysis. Knight before, yeah. knight takes before, oh, okay, but... takes before. And we got yeah. queen d2, rook c8, a4. And this is the position that we have right now. And we do see a certain advantage for white, a tiny little one. Well, white's dream is to put one of the pieces where probably bishop, uh, well, knight actually. Oh, wow. If only I could put my, let's say, like pawn f4, or bishop f4, knight d4, b5, and knight c6, would that be, wouldn't that be a dream? Yeah, she will be going for things like that. For sure. I mean, I think she's making it clear that she wants to play b5 next. Um, the black queen is not really in danger yet, I suppose, because we could always go to b3. But it's, you know, it's in some danger because knight d4 can happen. Once she goes b5, actually, that queen starts being in some danger. But, I mean, it can still go to e4. So after rook fc1, you can still try to escape to e4. Yeah, you can't really go to b3 anymore because then knight d4 is going to, well, it's going to be a problem for, for black. So I don't love black's position because I feel like it's not even that it's so bad. It's just that she has problems to solve and she has about 25 minutes. So I can easily imagine someone spending like, you know, 10 minutes in this position and then you're already at 15 minutes and then you're very close to time trouble. And the fact that white hasn't spent any time at all here, it's such a huge advantage because they're not even, you know, they're not even like, uh, they're, they're out of the opening. You know, they're out of the opening. They're somewhere deep in the middle game and you have 45 minutes left, which means like, I don't know how much of this was preparation and how much, how, you know, how fast it was just the, her decisions, uh, she was able to make them, but it is really impressive. And I think she's, she's put her opponents under a lot of pressure here.
Yeah, we can also see Polina thinking during, well, we used to see Polina thinking during her, the time of her opponent. So that could actually also explain the speed of her moves if he takes, if, if she takes, uh, ooh, if she takes some, yeah, well, if she uses the time correctly, then she can easily come up with fast moves. Here we see bishop b7, and I need to point out that there was this move, the only move that could keep with the equality. Apparently, we could investigate that a little bit. It's d4, wow. but nothing is clear here because it sacrifices the pawn. I mean, I love that idea. I can totally understand, and it's a very standard one. Um, you know, just bishop d4 and then bishop b7, and then you're getting this counterplay on the d file and white's extra pawn is a doubled pawn that's a beautiful beautiful idea i completely endorse it <laughs> and i wish i had found it myself <laughs> um but you know that's what i mean that this position it was making a lot of problems